All right, so you've got a manuscript. This is what I preach. Uh, deviate a little bit at times, but pretty much this is what we uh, this is what we get. Uh, again, I'm absent-minded sometimes, so I don't uh, necessarily remember everything. So I've got to keep a keep the manuscript there. So, but you know, we are free in our uh, our ability to to talk and converse. I can always find my spot. Somebody's always got a mark, right? Usually Mr. Reese will help me get back to where I was at. But uh, last week we began to uh, dig into the doctrine that it's really that is unique not only to Christianity but to the Reformed version of Christianity, which we ascribe to, is uh, the doctrine of assurance of salvation. Now, uh, everybody, whether they're Arminian or Calvinist or whatever, you know, bad word is out there now, um, that you find yourself, most Southern Baptists seem to be kind of in the middle, but we, we definitely ascribe to the more reform, reform version. Uh, but all of them have some type of assurance of salvation, right? Uh, that's, that's always something that is there. However, for the, uh, for the uh, Armenian, the other, the other side, they're, they're more... Uh, assurance comes from um, if whether or not they've behaved well enough and, and all of that. Uh, it's more based on themselves, uh, the, the, them keeping themselves in, in salvation. Southern Baptists for, forever have always believed in a once saved, always saved doctrine. That's what we always believe. Well, uh, if you're new to this particular kind of stuff, that is reformed. Uh, that would be considered Calvinism. Uh, now, that doesn't mean you have to be uh, a complete Calvinist like we are, but it is Calvinistic. Uh, you, you are saved by grace through faith, uh, and once you are saved, you are saved forever. Uh, once God has done the work, it is a work that is eternal. And, uh, and then, so there you go. Uh, we also, in that blanket of the, what is called perseverance of the saints, is a little bullet that is the assurance of salvation. Now, everybody uh, across the board has um, a doctrine of assurance, but, um, and, and then I might not say that most people uh, at some point in their walk have struggled with their assurance, right? Uh, have you ever doubted your salvation, for example? Uh, some people do that. As a matter of fact, we also, we've got some folks times that have been baptized more than once uh, and the reason for that is, is they've you know, they prayed a prayer once when they were younger they didn't quite think that it was really right they did it because big brother did or sister did or whatever and uh, you know they figured you know I'm actually safe now so I need to 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 get rebaptized and all that good stuff and that's true and that happens uh, and then there are some that just doubted their salvation right uh, have you ever wondered if it's possible to know if you're saved? Um, we've all struggled with that. What causes this? Uh, uh, what causes us to question salvation? Those are all questions that we've probably had at one time, right? Yeah, uh, nods. Yeah, okay, good. So talking to the right people, right? We we've doubted our salvation. We've we've questioned it. We wondered uh, if it wasn't. And if if I could just say this. If you, if, you, if you don't have a very good uh, Bible study time, a daily uh, intake of the Word of God, um, if, if, if that is part of your, your, your life, if you struggle with, with reading the Scriptures, uh, setting aside an hour or so, you know, not, it doesn't have to be an exact hour, but if, you're, if you struggle with setting aside a time to study the Word, then you're going to struggle with your salvation. Okay? If, if, you, if you don't have a daily intake of the Word of God, if you don't have a daily uh, 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 Bible study prayer time, you're struggling with it. Right? And, and might I say, the, the wisdom literature says, he that turns his ear from hearing the Word of God, even his prayer is an abomination. So they go hand in hand. right? And you can't pray to God and ask for things if you're not studying His Word. Right? I mean, it just it's not... It's impossible to, to reconcile that. So you're going to struggle with that. If, if I could just get that into your head, uh, for me anyway, the 
times that in my life that I struggled with uh, doubting salvation and things like that was when I lacked a study time. Okay, it's imperative that we are connected to the Word of God, right? Which happens to be an evidence of, of the uh, of salvation, right? An evidence of the assurance of salvation because the Word of God speaks to us, right? It speaks to our hearts, it speaks to our minds. It assures us. It it it, it, it it's a testimony with inside of ourselves, right? Can I, um, can I jump in here? Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, I struggle with reading the Bible in mm -hmm. the morning every day. I try to read it at night, mm -hmm. but the game changer for me was buying um, a one-year Bible uh -huh. that actually had the dates on it, like June 5th, and the <clears throat> Old Testament, New Testament, Psalms, Proverbs every day. Right. So you don't get burned out with the Old Testament trying to get through mm -hmm. Leviticus or something. And I've read the Bible through using that same one-year Bible multiple times. But right. you're right. I mean, if you don't have a plan, and this is the only plan I've found that works, is it has to have the date. You can't say day 65. You know, right. <laughs> it has to have the date, and then you can't just sit there and read the Old Testament and expect to keep up with it. You know, mm -hmm. you've got to have the four different things. Yeah. I think that's just so. whatever works, right? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like a diet. Work. The best diet, whichever one you yeah. get on, right? Yeah. Damn. And uh, I'm, I'm the same way. I don't necessarily have to have a one-year plan, but you know, it's just constant reading. You know, I'm a teacher, yeah. so therefore I have to study quite a bit. I think it's about like 15 minutes. It's not an hour. I mean, I can't do an hour. I, I'll right. be honest with you, but right. 15 minutes I can do. Right. Yeah. But to, there has to be some time devoted to it, right? So again, it, it, he's right. It doesn't have to be an hour. Oh, it's great. But, uh, <laughs> it, it needs to it needs to encompass yeah. some time, some prayer time, some the mm -hmm. Word of God. Uh, I mean, look, this is our testimony, right? This is what we believe this to be the infallible, inerrant, authoritative, sufficient Word of God. Right? How can how can we function without the Word of God? So it is something that needs to be done daily. Um, and if you don't, uh, that you're going to get into the struggle. Of whether or not you're saved, <clears throat> doubting salvation, and things like that. Um, when we were first saved by God, we didn't question the validity of the experience. You remember that? Uh, it was an emotional time for some of us, as well as spiritual. Uh, there's weeping over sin, uh, but it's also followed by joy and hope. Uh, this uh, uh, experience that we call salvation. Uh, however, as we continued, in our walk, we continue to go to church and sit under the preaching of the Word, uh, uh, read the Bible for ourselves. Uh, we find it clear in the Scriptures that there are warnings of false confessions, right? False believers, uh, tares among the wheat, all that kind of stuff, right? We, we're, we become aware of that. And uh, that makes us wonder. Ultimately, the question then arises, is that me? Here's an example. Matthew 13, you have the parable of the sower. Verses 1 through 9, Jesus gives us this parable uh, where the sower goes out and casts seed on the field, and the seed lands on four different types of soil. Uh, I trust that uh, you've read that. If you haven't, we'll just give you an overview this morning, but I suggest going back and study. Verses 1 through 9, uh, or excuse me, some some of the seeds, they fell, they fell behind the uh, side of the, roads, the road. The birds of the air came and ate them up. Others fell on rocky places where they did not have much soil. Immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. When the sun had risen, they were scorched. Because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on good soil, and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So what we have is we have a uh, four different types of soil where the word of God, the seed, falls on. Uh, and we know, if we jump down to verses 18 through 23, Christ explains the parable, Right? Because the seed represents the word of the kingdom. That's the gospel. That's the word of God. Uh, so whenever you heard the word uh, preached, uh, and 
felt the need for salvation, you, uh, that was the word of the king. That's so where the casting seed uh, that, that, that was done uh, fell on the soil of your heart, right? The four types of soils are the hearts of people who hear the word and their responses. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, this is, this is the explanation. Verse 19. He says, when anyone hears the words, word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil, come, evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is what he says. This is the one of whom seed was sown beside the road, the road. The one on whom the seed was sown on the rocky places. This is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. The one falls on the road, the evil one snatches away, the next one is sown on rocky places. This is the guy who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. However, verse 21, yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, Immediately he falls away. So here we have one person that receives it. He walks the aisle. He prays the prayer. He's there for you know, the first six months. He's energetic. He's excited. However, when persecution comes, when the least little bit of resistance comes, he falls away. That's sad, isn't it? That's, that's a warning. The one whom, to whom, <clears throat> and the one on whom the seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word. Listen to this, and the worry of the world, and the deceitfulness of wealth, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Again, none of these, these, these soils reject it completely, right? Everybody wants to escape hell. He's not talking about the atheist or the, 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 the Baal worshippers or anything like that. He's talking about people that, that are open to hearing the word. Right? They have, maybe they have R's beside their names or they're Trump voters. If I could put it in the modern context, right? These, these, these are people that are open to the word of God. They have a form of mor a morality and virtue as it pertains to, to, to the world. Wealth comes, chokes the word, and becomes unfruitful. And the one on whom seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it and indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty. We produce fruit. So you've got one out of four of these soils produce fruit. That's not any type of actual percentage, right? We don't say that 25% of the people in church today are, are actual Christians and the rest are not. Uh, it could be, but uh, could be worse, could be a little better. But, you know, one out of four here of these soils of people who are open to the gospel at first away. So what we see is that there are those who will confess Christ at first, but after a while they fall away. In other words, the confession isn't genuine, right? It's not genuine, yeah. Uh, I'll hate to keep jumping no, in. No, go ahead. Uh, um, there's yeah, a real good video on YouTube by um, Living Waters, you know, Kirk Cameron's mm -hmm. uh, group, and it's called Genius. It's about a 30-minute movie on John Lennon, of all people, and it talks yeah. about how he's, you know, musical genius, and he actually confessed Christ. Mm -hmm. Jimmy Swagger got him, led, led him to the Lord, or whatever, and he tried out Jesus, and uh, Yoko Ono pulled him away, and it didn't give him what he wanted, and he fell away, yeah. and that's a great example of mm -hmm. sad. Very sad. It happens, happens a lot. Yeah. It happens a lot. <laughs> Seedfulness of riches, or fame, Whatever it might be. Or a woman. <clears throat> or a man.
that, that's in our minds now. You know, after a while, you know, we've heard the preaching of the gospel. Uh, you know, uh, when you first come to faith, you, you, you hear this gospel. You're open to it. You, you come running down the aisle. You pray the prayer. Uh, not that the prayer saves you or anything like that, but, uh, you know, you've done that religious experience. You've confessed Christ. And then all of a sudden, after a while, you find out that there are false confessions. There are false believers. But not only that, Matthew chapter 7. It is not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name did we not cast out demons? Did we not perform any miracles? Jesus says, Then I will declare to them, I never knew you depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. It's here that we learn not only do we also have people whose confession wasn't genuine and that eventually they fell away and they're gone now, but we've got people in the church now that are doing services. Prophesying, that are preaching, that are teaching, they are coming to Sunday school every day. They're checking all the boxes, right? They're doing everything they're supposed to do. Or what is their thing they think they're supposed to do? <coughs> they're casting out demons. I've never done that. They're performing miracles. They're prophesying. Jesus says, I never knew you could depart from They deceived themselves into thinking they possess salvation, but they really don't. There are those. Paul tells us to work out our own salvation with fear and truth. So there is the warning. Of course, with the presence of sin that is still in our lives, because our sanctification is not quite complete. The question inevitably arises in our hearts and in our minds, am I saved? And you must answer that question. Are you truly saved? Are you really a believer? And of course, the key to all these passages is that it gives us evidence of salvation or the lack thereof parable of the sower, the evidence of the genuine believer, the genuine soil over those that were not good soil is that it produced fruit. Do you produce fruit? That's the question. Do you produce fruit? Godly, righteous fruit? We know it's obvious that those who maybe walked the aisle, prayed the prayer, and then left three or four months later, or never came back. And when you ask them about Christ, they, they say, well, I've done, done that. I don't need to talk about that. They tell the same nasty jokes at work. They walk the same walk. They drink the same drinks. They do the same things. They're more worried about NFL than they are Sunday service, right? They do the same. It's It's obvious. Those are unbelievers. In the case of those who claim to cast out demons, they practice lawlessness. So we know that the test of, of a true believer is one who produces fruit, and that who is ceasing, if you will, from practicing lawlessness. Not the pattern of our lives. Of course, as we've seen in our study throughout chapter 8 of Romans, the true believer is one who's being led of the Spirit. It's imperative that, that you always read this. Or no, that you read all of the Bible. You can't just jump around. You need to read it in its context. Because it's so 
It's so eye-opening to understand what Paul has said throughout this 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 uh, this, uh, this uh, Romans, if you will, the depravity of man from chapter one uh, to chapter three, talking about all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God because of that inherited sin nature we see in chapter five from Adam, and then in our study of chapter eight, we also see that evidence of being a believer. We see that it is one that has been led by the Spirit of God. Verse 4, so that the requirement of law might be fulfilled in us. We do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. What about your mindset? We talked about that several weeks ago, right? Verse 10, if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. You're different, right? To be a Christian means that you're different. You're a different person. Uh, you have a different makeup. The nature has, has changed. That's the miracle of salvation. That's why we believe that, that God is the one that is responsible for salvation and God alone. I had no part in it. If, if, as a matter of fact, I proved throughout my life, before the preaching of the gospel came, before I was saved, that by my own free will, I followed hell every time. Every time. But I'm different. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Mortifying the flesh, are you putting to death the deeds of the body? We've asked all of this. We've, we've, we've examined ourselves. And that's an external evidence of our salvation, right? They're, they're, that's the test, right? We're obedient to Christ if we are truly saved. Now, there are those that believe they have to be obedient to Christ to be saved, and that's the, there is a difference. We're obedient because we are saved. And again, we have to clarify, right? Does that mean we don't sin at all? Well, that's the reason for the conversation, right? That's the reason that we question our assurance. Because we still sin. We do still sin. We're not going to be completely free of sin while in this body that has an appetite for the flesh. Remember chapter 7? You have the conflict of two natures. Paul talks about that. Well, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into the bondage of sin. But what I am doing, I do not understand, for, for I am not practicing what I like to do, but I'm doing the very thing that I hate. I find then the principle that is evil, that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good, for I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. In verse 25, he says, thanks to be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. He's got this conflict <coughs> with his two natures. The grieving for sin, if you will, is an evidence, is an evidence of your salvation. For the non-believer, for those that are faking it, it is the fear of hell that motivates them to stay or, or that motivates them to, to uh, or convicts them of whatever sin it might be in their lives. But there's an enjoyment for them, right? They want to keep it a secret. There's no repentance there. There's just... And sometimes it's hard to tell the difference, right? Between the fear of hell and the grieving of sin. There is always repentance in the life of the true believer. It's a repentance that leads to righteousness. We've been set free from being a slave of sin. However, my flesh is still fighting against me. But we're saved by grace through faith. Right? saved by grace through faith. So, our doctrine is not 
as the Armenian would say, that we believe that we can get saved and live any way we want. A lot of your Pentecostals uh, say that. That's the same thing they were applying uh, against Paul throughout Romans. We pointed those things out, right? This is what they, they said about Paul. Paul, you're preaching a cheap grace, a cheap salvation, a cheap belief. Uh, you believe, are you, you're preaching that, that people can just uh, confess Christ and live however their flesh desires. And that's not at all what Paul has ever said. That's not what he preached in Athens. That's not what he preached in Ephesus. That's not what he preached anywhere, right? That's, there's no way you can get that from the Scriptures. And he, and he makes it clear in Romans. And the implication is, is that we believe that grace is a license to sin. We call it antinomianism. No law. Licentiousness. It's, through, it's throughout the Scripture. That is one of the themes or the accusations throughout Paul's writings that is brought against him. Okay, now, this is what the Judaizers would say about it. The Judaizers were free willers, right? They works-based salvation. But that's just what they were. I have to do this, this, and this in order to be saved. Uh, matter of fact, when Jesus said in John 6, because I have said that none can come to me unless it has been granted to, my, by, granted to him by my Father, it says at the end of that passage, it says many of his disciples walked with him no more. That is after the feeding of the 5,000. He has multitudes upon multitudes of followers. And because he said that, they left. They wanted nothing to do with it. Because they wanted some part, some parcel in their salvation. They wanted to be responsible for something. Well, I, I, I'm not an Armenian, but I but, do have some questions a little bit about like a five-point Calvinist. But mm -hmm. And, and said, most, most do. Yeah, so when you said we have no part in it, but you have to repent. That's the responsibility okay. of man. So, just check. When you can reconcile that, let yeah. me know. Uh, just check. There's a responsibility, yes, absolutely. I mean, we, we are unapologetically Calvinist here. Um, and that's, that, that it's clear we have a uh, new members class, by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can't just jump in here, but uh, uh, it's a uh, yes. We believe, of course, historical Christianity would would also uh, back us up on this. The Reformation that lasted for uh, the first hundred years of the Reformation was was completely reformed. Uh, Martin Luther's uh, primary work, aside from the uh, uh, translation of the Bible into the German language, was a rebuttal to uh, uh, a guy named Erasmus. Uh, he wrote a diatribe, Erasmus did, to Martin Luther to entice him to debate on freedom of the will, and uh, Martin Luther responded, bondage of the will. Our will, our volition, is in bondage to our nature, which is one of sinfulness, apart from salvation. Right, and uh, so that and the ninety-five thesis on the door of the Church of Wittenberg was a pretty big deal. But uh, uh, John Knox, Calvin, of course, Zwingli, uh, Jurg Zwingli, all these, the Martin Luther, William Tyndale, who translated the Bible into English for us, the, the fathers of the Reformation, even the Morning Stars of the Reformation, Wycliffe and Haas, uh, or Huss, was uh, was. Uh, very much an Augustinian in nature when it came to the, to the uh, will of man, uh, man's just his ability or lack thereof. Man doesn't have the ability to come to Christ because of the fall. We are, from the fall, completely fallen in Adam. Even our will, <coughs> volition, is uh, under the bondage of sin. It has to be Christ saving us. And again, I would encourage you all to at least stay through the preaching of or the teaching of Romans chapter nine, that will end all discussion, uh, or should anyway, when we get there. But um, um, it is the work of God that saves us. Uh, we believe that it is that it is grace that has saved us. So, in other words, we don't we don't take this. Um, 
uh, grace is a license to sin. And we know the difference. And we are assured because of the Word of God, because of the external evidence uh, of our life, our changed life, our changed nature, that we are children of God, that we are saved. Um, we believe that Christ has saved us by grace through faith. And according to verse 1 of chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, that's assurance, right? That's a definite statement of salvation forever. Uh, not just as long as you don't sin, right? Because you know, um, the other side believes you can fall in and out of salvation um, because of your own will. Uh, it's just a kind of a, uh, it's just the way they, they think that that is their, it's a logical outcome to what they believe. Just like for us, uh, eternal security is a logical outcome. If God has saved us uh, by his own power, uh, then there is no way that we can fall from grace ever because he has saved us for eternity. Uh, once he's called us uh, out of darkness, there is no, uh, there is no falling from that. Uh, but therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, so, though I still sin, I'm growing in grace and producing fruit throughout my whole life. It is Christ that has and is and will continue to seize my flesh, to seize my mind, and to seize my soul until I am glorified. Is that not hopeful? Is him who seized my flesh. He conquered what I could not. He lived the life that I could not live. He died the death that I should have died. And he has imputed to me righteousness. His righteousness. Amen? Amen. So, not only is there an external evidence, but there is also an internal evidence. We're going to look at our passage now, 14 through 17. And uh, we're going to look closely at verses 16 through 17. Because last week we looked at 14 through 15. So let, let's read it and then we'll, uh, we'll uh, maybe get done. Verse 14 says, For all who are be, uh, being led by the Spirit of God, there's an evidence there, right? If you're being led of the Spirit of God, then these are sons of God. Now, again, he, in the previous verses, he qualified all that. Right? Talking about us being uh, at odds with with the flesh, uh, the, the differences between those that are led by the flesh and those that are led by the spirit, and we concluded that we were being led by the spirit because of what the word of God says about us. Right? These are the sons of God. So you and I are children of God, but we have not received a spirit of slavery again to fear. But you've received a spirit of adoption, as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, so that we, may be all, so that we also may be glorified with him. Uh, as we noted last week, the picture here is of an adoption in Roman life. That's what we, uh, we have here. Uh, the first step is uh, to be totally severed from the boy's legal and social relationship to his natural family. Uh, and the second step placed him permanently into his new family. Uh, so it's not a Jewish adoption that Paul is reflecting, but it is a Roman one. Paul would have been familiar with the Roman adoption laws in Rome. Uh, he would have known what was going on there. Especially somebody that came out of a, an adoption of into you know from slavery, uh, all his previous debts and other obligations were eradicated. Uh, the picture there is of our sin and our debt uh, that, that we incurred because of our sin, uh, the punishment uh, for that, uh, and it is as if they had never existed. Praise God, right? Praise God, all those sins have been eradicated. We know that past the illustration of adoption that, that, that all my sins present and future have been cleansed, right? 
We've been saved. We've been adopted. The transaction had become legally binding. It required the presence of seven uh, reputable witnesses who could testify if necessary to any challenge of the adoption after the father's death. That's represented, uh, represented by our behaviors. Uh, we have a changed nature. Um, those, those witnesses, we have one witness that testifies for us, which is the Spirit, as we see in verse 16. That's that, that's that term there, right? That's, that, that's where those witnesses come, come into play. Uh, Paul's, Paul, doubtless, was well aware of that custom, and he may have uh, had it in mind as he penned the section of Romans. He assures believer of the wondrous truth that they are indeed God's adopted children. And that because of that immeasurably gracious relationship, they have full right and privilege to cry out, Abba, to God as their Heavenly Father, just as every child does to his earthly father. Amen. Amen. We have a spirit now that cries out, Abba, Father. Uh, that is, we've been adopted into the beloved. We talked last week about adoption being one of the uh, wonderful signs that uh, that uh, one, uh, you know one of the most Christ-like things that, that a person can do uh, is adopt a child, especially out of a bad relationship or excuse me, a bad situation, uh, foster care, whatever it might be. <clears throat> you were damned and doomed and on your way to hell. Uh, you had no chance, no hope of glory, no nothing. But Christ snatched you from the from the bowels of hell. He snatched you, he shined the light of his gospel on the darkness of your depravity and seated you in the heavenlies. He's robed you in righteousness. He's crowned you with glory. You're going to a city whose builder and maker is God. Praise him. Praise him. Abba Father. Amen? Amen. The Spirit bears witness. Again, the next page, page five, is the Spirit bear, bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Uh, it's that witness, he testified, if you will. He testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Paul does not have in mind some mystical small voice that's telling us we are saved. That's, that's not what he's saying. He's referring to the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. If you parallel Galatians with your study of Romans, you'll see that Galatians is just a, a smaller, abridged version. Right? I mean, there's some differences and there's some contextual differences. Uh, but Paul is pretty much, he had to fight the Jews and the Judaizers and the Antinomians in Rome, just like he did in Galatia, right? So there's much of the same thing as discussed. It's very consistent. Uh, uh, some say it's redundant, and it is redundant, uh, the study of God's Word. You read the Synoptic Gospels, there's a lot of redundancy there, but I, I you know, I think that means uh, that we have a hard time getting it, right? And it needs to be hammered in our in our minds, in our souls. That's right, repetition. Uh, Galatians 5.20, let's look at that. Uh, Galatians 5.21, verse 23. It's right there in your notes. It says, but the fruit, notice that's singular, it's not plural, you don't get to choose one and leave the others behind, right? It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. Let me just tell you. Apart from salvation, I had none of these. None of these. There was no goodness in me. There was no gentleness in me. There was no love, no joy, no peace, no nothing. It must be a work of God. that performs this. It is the miraculous, right? He who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. It is a change of nature. I keep saying that. It's not my will that caused me to be born again. Right? I was groping in darkness. Matter of fact, it was even worse than that. I was dead in my trespasses and sins. And God saved me. God breathed new life into me. He took the heart of stone and gave me a heart of flesh. 
Nothing that I did. All this fruit of the Spirit is the inner evidence, and external evidence for that matter, and is the testimony of the Holy Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Do you possess these qualities? Is there a difference after salvation from the man you are now, or woman you are now? When believers are compared, compelled by love for God, they feel deep hatred for sin, they reject the world, they long for Christ's return, they love other Christians, they experience answered prayer, they just discern between truth and error, they long for and move toward Christ's likeness. The work of the Holy Spirit is evidenced, and those believers have witnessed that they are truly children of God. Is that your experience? Is that what you believe? Is that what has happened to you? Not only that, not only does your spirit bear witness with, with God's spirit, or God's spirit, rather bear witness with yours that you're children of God, but you are also heirs. If you are children, then you're heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. In Roman society, although a father had the prerogative of giving more to one child than to the others, normally all children received equal shares. <coughs> and under Roman law, inherited possessions enjoyed more protection than those that were bought or worked for. Paul's probably reflecting on those Roman customs and laws. His emphasis on this passage is the equality of God's children and the security of their adoption. It is secure. The only way that your inheritance will fade away is if God fades away. Right? And I've got news for you. He's the God that never sleeps nor slumbers. He doesn't get sick. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He is king of glory. He was and is and is to come. He is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the ending. There is none like him unto him. He is the great God of glory. Amen? What else can we have? Verse 34, the king, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 25, verse 34 says this. Then the king will say to those on his, on his right, he's talking about the sheep and the goats, the goats. In the final judgment, he says, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you, for you from the foundation of the world. Not an afterthought, is it? not something that, that, that surprised him. He prepared it for you from the foundation of the world. We are all co-heirs with Christ. All that Christ claims is his belong to all of us as well. He says the last verse or the last Statement. We've got to hurry it up. Y'all got to listen faster, right? He <laughs> says, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Uh, now, just real quick, we've got to get a little academic. That in, if indeed, uh, that's grasped a hold of by some, uh, especially those that believe you can lose your salvation or that your salvation is conditional based on whether or not uh, you, know, you, you do something. Uh, that this... Uh, this is a conditional participle with an indicative mood. Uh, now, it, here's the problem. This is a language. It's a romance language. It's written in Koine Greek. We have to translate it to English. We don't have this structure in the English language. Okay? Uh, so, uh, I'm not trying to uh, deflect. There's, there, there's no um, motivation here to... to, to I mean, I, I guess there is some motivation prove my belief system, uh, but th this is the truth of it. Uh, it. Indicative mood means that it assumes the fact. All right? It's really kind of like saying, if so be, 
as is really the case. Or, this commentator says, what appears to be a condition on this promised inheritance, if indeed, is actually a simple statement of fact. If indeed is a simple statement of fact. Uh, so in other words, we are going to share in the sufferings of Christ that leads to sharing in His glory. We don't share in the redemptive sufferings of Christ, but we do share in the consequences in terms of the opposition from the world uh, that, he, that He came to save. We share in the trials of life as well as the benefits. Right? There is opposition to us. If the restrainer, for example, is taken out of the way in this country, uh, like it is in other parts of the world, uh, be left, they will attack you. They will get rid of homeschooling. They don't want you teaching your children that thus saith the Lord God. They want to take your kids and teach them that 50 billion years ago, some baboon second on a banana became a person or something. Uh, right? But this is what they will have you believe. They'll take all that away. They'll persecute you. It will happen. And I'm not saying left politically. because I don't care who you vote for. right? Let the word of God take care of that. Vote, as Pastor Allen says, as the baby's life depends on it, right? But the fact of the matter is, is you will be attacked. It's the moment the restrainer is taken out of the way. They will do unspeakable things. It will happen. There will be no protection by a constitution or anything like that. There is an active opposition to you as a believer by the world. And indeed, that is true, right? Philippians 3 and verse 10 says, That I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, in order that I might attain to the resurrection from the dead. So that same threat that was in Paul's day, that was in Christ's day, that was in the early church's day, is alive today. Now, again, we have a constitution. We have, at least for a little while, some, some protections against that, physical protections, but it is there. If that threat is there. If they'll kill their babies, they'll kill you. Amen? 1 Peter 4, 12-13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you uh, for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of the Christ, keep rejoicing, so that also, at the revelation of His glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. And all this, that we may also be glorified with Him. Amen? Amen. Let's be done. Let's get to the bathrooms and then get to church. Father, Lord, again, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, that though it takes us a while to pick away at the study in Romans, we pray, Father, that uh, again, your name be glorified in us. Um, that, we, uh, that we have a full assurance of the faith. That we uh, exhibit and exude, if you will, this doctrine of perseverance of the saints, of assurance. Lord, we, there's lots of things that we don't understand. But we know that our salvation is of you and you alone. And Father, we pray that we live by it. I pray for Pastor Allen as he preaches your word, uh, that in him your name would be glorified. I pray for us in the hearing that we are obedient. So again, glory of, of your name is that our single purpose is our unity. Lord, again, in Christ's name I pray this prayer. Amen. Amen. Amen.